To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for their care of their land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank everyone for joining our virtual presentation today. Our speaker this afternoon is Jenna Noss, who will be presenting on clinical presentation and outcomes of children treated for Lyme arthritis, experienced from a large pediatric cohort in Nova Scotia, Canada. Jenna is a second year medical student at Dalhousie University. Jenna grew up on the South Shore of Nova Scotia where Lyme disease is very prevalent, making research in Lyme disease a passion of hers. Her current research involves exploring pediatric Lyme arthritis. We're going to have Jenna present today, and then we're going to open up questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering into the chat box, or you can raise your hand using the hand icon, or if time allows, you can also unmute and ask your question directly. Please help us welcome Jenna to the podium. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen now. I'm really excited to be part of this event, and I hope um, I'm excited to hear everybody's questions afterwards. So I just want to confirm that that all looks okay, Veronica? Uh, looks great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So um, as Veronica said, I'm a second year medical student um, at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, and I'm going to be presenting on my ongoing medical research project, which I won't repeat the long title again. Um, and I don't have any disclosures uh, to disclose. So first, I'm just going to provide some background information on Lyme disease, as I'm aware that there could be people from all different types of backgrounds attending today's talk. And I expect most people will probably be familiar with this information already. So Lyme disease is the result of an infection with Borrelia burgdorferi, and in Eastern North America, it's transmitted to humans by the black-legged tick or the Ixodi scapularis. So the areas in dark purple here are areas of high risk in Nova Scotia. And you can really see it's a large proportion of the province. And this data is from 2019. So I'm sure it has increased since then. Um, some of these regions have the highest incidence of Lyme disease in the country. And I grew up on the South shore of Nova Scotia and uh, tick preventive um, awareness was a normal part of our lives, the daily tick checks and multiple of my friends and family have uh, been diagnosed with various forms of Lyme disease. So that's really where my passion um, for Lyme stems from and why I wanted to be involved in Lyme research. So the clinical manifestations of Lyme disease are categorized into three stages. The first being early localized presentation, which occurs days to weeks after the tick bite and includes the symptoms such as the recognizable erythema migrans rash and flu-like illness, which could have fever, headaches, arthralgias, et cetera. Um, the second stage is early disseminated Lyme, which occurs weeks to months after the tick bite and may include multiple EM lesions, systemic symptoms, neurobiliosis, and carditis. And lastly, the third stage is uh, late disseminated Lyme, which presents months to years after the tick bite and is the category that Lyme arthritis is in. And that's really what we're gonna focus on today. So Lyme arthritis can be difficult to identify and diagnose clinically due to many factors. And we're gonna to touch a bit on those today. So it disproportionately affects children and is often their first symptom of Lyme disease. Most of the patients with Lyme arthritis don't have the typical and recognizable erythema migraines rash or do they recall a tick bite? It resembles other forms of childhood arthritis, making, again, diagnosis difficult. They typically present with arthritis in large synovial joints, recurrent swelling, and a moderate inflammatory effusion, with the knee being the most commonly involved joint. The picture on the right here is from a patient from the IWK Rheumatology Clinic in Nova Scotia. And this was a Lyme arthritis patient whose family has provided permission for this picture to be used for educational purposes. And you can really appreciate this massive effusion on her right knee. Um, and these joint effusions with Lyme arthritis can be very large. And you typically wouldn't see that large of an effusion with other forms of childhood arthritis, such as JIA or juvenile idiopathic arthritis. 
So also with this presentation here, if this um, patient was presenting acutely, it may make the clinician worried about um, something called a septic joint or an infection of the joint. And um, that would require a different pathway of treatment than Lyme arthritis would, and it could involve unnecessary treatments. So most children will fully recover from Lyme arthritis with antibiotic treatment, but up to 25% will have continued arthritis, which is termed post-infectious Lyme arthritis or PILA, which is what I'll refer to it from here on out. This is recognized as recurrent or chronic arthritis after three months of initiating antibiotic treatment. And it's not explained by a persistent infection. There's currently no standard treatment for PILA, but they're typically treated with anti-rheumatic therapies and are at a risk for long-term complications from chronic arthritis. So in 2015, the researchers at the IWK Rheumatology Clinic published their experience treating 17 children with Lyme arthritis, and this was from 2006 to 2013. From then, the clinic has seen more than a tenfold increase in Lyme arthritis patients. So the objective of my study was to describe the presentation and clinical course of children with Lyme arthritis that were seen at the IWK Pediatric Rheumatology Clinic. So I completed a retrospective chart review, identifying patients who are less than 18 years of age with Lyme arthritis, who had at least one follow-up visit after initiating antibiotics from the IWK Pediatric Rheumatology Clinic database. We defined Lyme arthritis as the clinical evidence of arthritis with a history of residence in or a visit to a Lyme disease endemic area and a positive two-tiered serologic test. Post-infectious Lyme arthritis or PILA was defined as persistent arthritis three months after initiating antibiotics. We then collected demographic, clinical, and treatment data from the patient charts and completed statistical analysis. So before I get into the results of this study, I wanted to highlight the reality of the complexity that some of these cases can be. And I thought I'd uh, present a representative case of what the presentation and treatment these patients might experience. So here we have an 11 year old female who had an acute onset of a huge right knee swelling in June. She was afebrile and she was seen in the local emergency department two days later and unable to wait there. She had no history of a tick bite, no symptoms of early localized or early disseminated Lyme disease. On initial investigations, she had elevated inflammatory markers, both ESR and CRP, and they did a joint aspiration of the knee and um, drew fluid and found that there was an increased white blood cell count and a suggestion of an acute inflammatory process. The Lyme serology was also drawn at this time, but at that point, they don't have the results and it could take up to 48 hours or longer for um, the Lyme serology to come back. So the physician is then faced with what they should do. Should they start treatment right away or wait until the Lyme disease um, serology comes back? So in this case, the emergency physician calls rheumatology at the IWK and they decide to start doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, um, empirically. The child was then referred to rheumatology for follow-up. After this, the Lyme serology does come back positive. So jumping back to my study, um, we identified a total of 210 patients between the years of 2006 and 2022, which was quite an increase from the previous study with the total of 17 patients. Almost half of the patients have presented over the past two years, and that's seen on the figure on the right. So the median age was nine, ranging from two to 16. 66% of patients were male. Only 24% of patients result, recalled a tick bite, and only 7% had a reported history of erythema migraines rash. This data again emphasizes the difficulty in diagnosis, as often um, patients may be asked if they had a tick bite or remembered having flu-like illness or a history of erythema migraines rash in use for screening for Lyme disease. We found that symptom onset was decreased between April and June. And since Lyme arthritis is a late presentation, this is when we can assume that most tick bites are occurring. 
So the pie chart on the left here shows the referral sources. The top three referral sources were family physicians, orthopedic surgeons, and emergency physicians, making up a total of 80% of referrals. And most patients were referred for joint pain and swelling. 60% were referred with a diagnosis of Lyme disease, and 80% had Lyme serology available at their first visit with rheumatology. And this was increased considerably since the first study, which suggests to the increased awareness of both Lyme serology and Lyme arthritis in Nova Scotia. The graph on the right here shows that the majority of patients saw two or more healthcare providers regarding their joint symptoms prior to rheumatology referral. So 48% of the patients had episodic joint symptoms. So that means that their joint symptoms would come and go and not last consistently. The knee was involved in 92% of patients. One joint was involved in 57%, two to four joints in 36%, and five or more joints in 7%. So 35% of our patients had a joint aspiration, which is a procedure where they insert a needle, extract synovial fluid from the joint, and then complete investigations. 4% had an arthrotomy, which is an exploratory surgery of the joint. And 18% of the patients were admit admitted to hospital during their course of treatment. So we found there was a significant range of laboratory features. Some of the patients had no systemic inflammation and others had very high markers of inflammation, such as a CRP of 300, which you can see in the chart there. Similarly, for the synovial fluid white blood cell count, it ranged from minimally inflammatory to numbers that would make you concerned for a septic joint if the patient was presenting acutely. And just important to note that most of these investigations in this chart were completed prior to rheumatology visit. So jumping back to the 11-year-old girl, so her follow-up with rheumatology occurred one week after completing the doxycycline antibiotics. Her right knee had improved within one week of starting it. However, her left knee then became swollen and painful. She was well otherwise and had no history of fever. Although this is unusual, they do see in the rheumatology clinic patients that are started on antibiotics and sometimes after completing the antibiotics that develop a new joint swelling. At rheumatology, she was found to have a moderately swollen right knee and normal range of motion, but her left knee had a large swelling. It was warm, painful, and she had decreased range of motion. So what are the next steps for treatment and are there any guidelines to help clinicians decide what to do next? So there is a, a lot of different approaches to treating Lyme arthritis, and that's a lot to do with there not being a lot of evidence on how to treat it. There are treatment guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology, which provides clear initial treatment. Um, so that would include the one course of oral antibiotics for 28 days. But after that first month of treatment, the next steps are less clear. The ACR guidelines state that if there's a partial improvement, there's no recommendation for doing observation, which is just waiting to see what happens versus a second course of antibiotics. And those that have no response or minimal improvement, there's a weak recommendation with low quality evidence for two to four weeks of IV cephalotriaxon. And lastly, they weekly recommend that if you fail a course of oral and IV antibiotics, that you're referred to a specialist with many treatment options to be considered, which may include an intraarticular steroid injection, a disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs, and biologic agents. So, what about injecting the joint? Um, a study published in 2019 had emerging evidence showing that treat children treated um, with a joint injection had lower rates of post infectious Lyme arthritis and faster rates of clinical resolution. And this didn't seem to matter whether they had the injection alone or with a second course of oral antibiotics. But it's important to just note that this was a small cohort. So for our case, the two options were discussed with the family, having a second course of 28 days of oral antibiotics or 28 days of IV ceftriaxone. 
and they decided for another month of oral antibiotics. So after um, two weeks after completing the second course of oral antibiotics, which um, to note, this is almost three months after initiating antibiotics. So getting close to that PILA um, definition. At this time in clinic, she had full right knee improvement, but the left knee still had active arthritis with a moderate swelling, warmth, and stress pain on full flexion, but normal range of motion. So at this time, they decided to do blood work and they re-examined the inflammatory markers, which had decreased, but were still elevated. So the options were presented to the family and um, they discussed the lack of quality evidence to inform clear next steps. They could do the IV ceftriaxon, which would be considered most consistent with the ACR guidelines, but having a PICC line inserted and daily antibiotics for a month when you're 11 year old, years old isn't very attractive. Um, the family was conflicted what to do next. A joint injection was not consistent with ACR guidelines, but there's emerging evidence that it may be a safe approach. And the third option would be to aspirate the joint for further data. So this girl was very stoic, who was okay having another aspiration of her knee done, awake in clinic. This would have been a more difficult decision if they needed to bring um, her back into clinic and be sedated in order to aspirate the joint. So the synovial fluid came back and had decreased white blood cell counts from the initial uh, joint aspiration. And um, the results suggested an evolution from an acute inflammatory process to a more chronic inflammatory process. So the family then opted for a steroid injection of the left knee. So on the last visit with rheumatology, one month after injecting the knee, both knees were cool. There was no swelling, um, full range of motion, and she was pain-free. So this is the end of this um, representative case that I'm presenting. And I hope that you understand the complexity and variability of treating um, pediatric Lyme arthritis and why that the results I show you next might seem a bit variable um, due to the lack of clear guidelines for PILA cases. So back to our cohort um, and study for treatment, 67% of our patients received one course of antibiotics 24% received two, and 9% received three. IV ceftriaxone was used in 35 treatment courses. 35 children developed PILA, and of the patients with PILA, 46% were treated with a steroid injection, 46% with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, 8% with disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and one out of the 35 received a biologic treatment. And it's important to note that some of these patients received more than one treatment. So of those with PILA, we had five with ongoing evidence of active arthritis at their last follow-up, which was 2% of the entire cohort. So in the next steps of our study, we're hoping to identify potential predictors for PILA, and this would help determine the best course of treatment for these patients in the future. So in previously completed studies, PILA has been positively correlated with older age, male sex, knee-only presentation, duration of symptoms prior to antibiotic treatment greater than six weeks, a high platelet count, and high synovial fluid white blood cell count. And it's been negatively correlated with high ESR and history of fever. So we're hoping to look at these variables and then determine if there's any correlation with PILA in our cohort. So just to wrap things up here, there's been a significant increase in the number of children with Lyme arthritis referred to the IWK Pediatric Rheumatology Clinic. And the outcome for most children is excellent, but almost a third will require more than one course of antibiotics due to incomplete response. And just over 15% will require ongoing follow-up for PILA. We hope in the next steps of our study to again identify any potential predictors for PILA that may help determine the best course of treatment for these patients in the future. So I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and I hope you know a little bit more about Lyme arthritis now. And um, I want to thank all those who have been involved in this project along the way. And I welcome any questions.
Thanks so much, Jenna, for your presentation on Lyme arthritis of the pediatric population. Uh, we're going to open up to questions from the audience. I'm um, looking at the chat. There is not any questions in the chat. So I'm going to now move over to the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand icon and we'll get started with the questions for Jenna. While we're waiting for people to raise their hand, did you guys have an opportunity to do any comparisons of Lyme arthritis for pediatric populations across the other Atlantic provinces um, with your colleagues or even across Canada? Um, I just remember a couple of years ago um, when Dr. Stringer did a presentation with Dr. Lesko from Queens, um, it varied Lyme arthritis across the country. So I just wondered whether you guys had done some research. Yeah, so um, the IWK would uh, serve both New Brunswick, um, PEI, and Nova Scotia, and um, none of the patients that have been referred to the IWK um, have been outside of Nova Scotia yet, um, but they're kind of expecting that to happen um, as the ticks kind of move more that way, um, but it hasn't been compared yet to um, other cohorts in Canada. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Jenna? Uh, go ahead, Terry. Hi, Jenna. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. I just have a quick question, and I don't know. Um, do you see many children or patients presenting with neurological symptoms uh, when talking about Lyme disease? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, so none of those in our cohort had any neurological symptoms. Um, and um, sorry, I just got distracted by the other question. Um, yeah, so none of those in our cohort were um, had any carditis or um, neurological symptoms. Um, Thanks, Jenna. Um, we have a question in the chat box, and then I'm going to move it over to Nima. Uh, the question in the chat box is, thanks for a great presentation, Jenna. I'm curious if the side effects of long courses of antibiotics are tolerated any better in children compared to adults. Mm -hmm. um, so one, one thing that they find with uh, the antibiotics, the longer, some of the children can be um, quite sensitive to it, um, like gastrointestinal um, symptoms. Uh, and as well, like with doxycycline, you're more sensitive to um, sun. So uh, sunscreen and preventative measures are really important if they're on it. Um, uh, but I, I'm not sure about how tolerated compared to adults. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't answer that a little bit better. That's okay. I'll move it over to Nema. Go ahead with your question. Thank you very much, uh, Jenna, for your presentation. It was excellent. Did I understand well that uh, the inclusion criteria was to have two positive tests for your patients? And yes. Yes. Yeah, so what did you do with the patient who didn't have a positive test? Um, so the, the in Nova Scotia, we do the two-tiered um, serologic tests for Lyme disease. So every person that gets tested for Lyme receives two um, tests. Uh, so um, they used to send, they used to do the ELISA and then the Western blot and it would get sent to, oh, I believe Winnipeg um, to get the Western blot done. But now it's just two ELISA tests that are done right in house in Nova Scotia. And that has um, decreased our, our time wait for the results before sometimes people were waiting weeks to receive back um, their uh, test results. So that could delay treatment for those patients sometimes. So now patients can receive them um, in a few days, which helps a lot. So we didn't, we didn't have any that were excluded for not having two uh, tests because in Nova Scotia, they all receive two. But my, my question was uh, for the negative one. Do oh, I see. To Elisa. Um, so, uh, if the patient didn't test positive for Lyme disease, then they weren't considered to have Lyme arthritis. So if, if they were, um, presenting acutely with a knee swelling, um, they would get referred usually to rheumatology and they may have received a diagnosis of, of some other type of arthritic disease or, or septic joint. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, and the question, okay, uh, thanks for your presentation. Did the patients with uh, Eero these in migrant uh, REM receive ATB and I guess antibiotics at the time of their first symptoms? Um, great question. Uh, so in most of the cases um, that I'm kind of recalling off the top of my head um, that did have the erythema migraines rash, um, it was often the parents would be like when they're kind of discussing the, the arthritic symptoms, when you're asked, did your child have a, a rash any time in the last couple months? Um, they'd be like, oh yeah, they did. And sometimes they bring up pictures. Um, so I would say in the majority of, of cases, um, I don't recall any that were treated with antibiotics um, prior to getting treated for the Lyme arthritis. Um, Cause we would, we would assume if they received a, a, a proper treatment for the um, early Lyme symptoms that they wouldn't then develop Lyme arthritis months later. Hopefully that answers that. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, do we have any more questions for Jenna? Not seeing any more questions for you, Jenna. We'll just take one more look. Well, I do want to thank you for taking the time today because uh, I know you're quite busy with your studies and your clinical practice <laughs> trying to squeeze us in. So thank you again for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to remind the audience, I'm just going to share my screen that we are continuing our presentation. Uh, we have one more uh, presentation tomorrow. Uh, Dina Palamides is presenting on the topic, not ticking the right boxes, my experience with Lyme and co-infections. Um, that presentation is tomorrow, Thursday, May 18th at 12 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern time. Then we'll take a break on Friday and then it is the long weekend. So I believe we are back on Tuesday with our next presentation next week. Just a reminder to take part in our challenge where Green take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness for Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. You can send your photos in to gmail.com along with your name and email. If you don't like your photos taken, but you are an artist out there and have poetry or pottery or drawings, sketches, paintings, feel free to take a picture if it expresses Lyme disease and tick-borne disease awareness to you. All entries received will be entered for a chance to win one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. And I will have to let you know that we haven't had too many entries yet. So you still have an opportunity of a high success rate of winning that uh, Starbucks e-gift card. So please remember to get your photos in before the end of the month. We will do our live draw on May 31st at one o'clock. Uh, when we have our last presenter. And finally, TicNet Canada will be having its inaugural scientific in-person symposium in Toronto, Ontario, October 24th and 25th. The planning committee is just finishing logistics. We hope to have registration and abstract submission open June 1st. So we're hoping to be able to share more details and a registration link with you towards the end of the month. So again, thank you to Jenna for your presentation. Thank you everybody for continuing to attend these presentations. And we hope to catch you tomorrow uh, when Dina is up presenting on her topic. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day and a great rest of your week and a great long weekend if you're taking the next few days off. Take care. Thanks, bye.